we started today, we knew it'd be a little different, but when, when you serve in ministry, most all of you know and realize you have to be flexible because you never know what God's got planned and or Satan either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to show up at, at motorcycle stuff and we expected like a, a tent and a sound system and all that and, and you would stand out in the hot sun and special music would get played over the cassette player on the Harley and, you know, things like that. But the message still goes out. That's the important part, not how we do it. But thank you to everybody who steps up and, and fills in and appreciate that. And, and so does the Lord. Um, okay. We're in Ezra chapter 1. Um, we started this last week. Um, and when we closed last week, we left off with these thoughts. That God wants to be worshipped, and he will move hearts to make that happen. The second thing was that God wants us all to participate in both the worship and the service. Service to the church and to each other. And the third thing is, is that God has a great and wonderful plan. And we used uh, Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, which say, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And remember, last week we learned that the, the word welfare in here can be interchanged with peace. Okay, and, and for he, God has plans for us for peace and not for evil that we would know good. This promise the Lord made to the nation of Israel, to his chosen people, and that, that same promise is good to, and true to us today as God's chosen people in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? It is the very same promise he made because we are chosen by him and selected before the beginning of time, Scripture tells us. So let's look at Ezra, chapter 1, and we'll read through chapter 2, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation through all his kingdom, and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of the God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, a thousand basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and a thousand other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All of these Shezbazar brought up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Now these are the people of the province who came up out of captivity of those Exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to his own town. Okay, we left off last week at verse 4. If we look, pick up at verse 5, it says, uh, Then rose up the heads 
of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. The phrase that I want to look at that first out there is stirred up. He stirred up their heart. The Hebrew word here literally means to rouse up or to awaken, to awaken. It's the same expression that was used in, in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 when it said the Lord stirred up Cyrus's heart, okay? He awoke his heart. The Lord stirred or awoken the hearts of his people, and he made many of them restless and unsettled with the knowledge that his temple was lying in ruins, and that there, so was their land that was in Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that we need to remember is the Jews at this point, they really weren't slaves. They were captives, but they didn't live as slaves in Persia um, like they did when they were in Egypt. When, uh, when the Egyptians took them captive, they treated them like slaves. They had nothing, and, and they were nothing, really, uh, to them. But here, uh, they were permitted to live like all the other Persians did. And many of them had risen to position of prosperity and influence. Now, last week we mentioned Daniel a little bit. Daniel was one of them that was taken captive. And he served in, under three different kings as a counselor and advisor to them. So he had, a, he had a pretty good position. And a lot of them did. So, excuse me a second. <laughs> so knowing that, then it's possible if we follow that thought through, that God's people had become comfortable and complacent in their situation. Comfortable and complacent in their situation. Therefore, the Lord stirred up their heart to be grieved over the fact that his temple, the holy temple, had been destroyed along with his chosen city, Jerusalem. They had become used to the idea. They were comfortable with where they were at. So, for a minute, let's talk about complacency, okay? As long as the subject's right there. Isn't one definition of complacency to be satisfied with the way things are? Or to be, um, to, or to just let them continue being? This is good enough, right? Is a phrase. Or, why the effort to change? I'm doing okay. Many of God's people, the Israelites that we're speaking of, had become quite comfortable in their captivity. And they were fitting into society there and doing well. Well, the problem is, society had a whole different perspective on how they should live, and also a whole different list of priorities as far as worship and who they should worship. And... The other part of that problem is that God did not intend for his people to make their permanent home outside of Judah. Remember, he sent them there as discipline. And he put a time period on that discipline, 70 years, remember? And he told them that, that they would be returned to their homeland. Their real home was not there in Persia. And God didn't want them to put down roots any place but in Judah and Jerusalem. And also, God wanted them to recognize that his heart was broken for them, the temple, and the city. And if they're comfortable, they won't recognize that. So, before we get too hard on the, on the Jews we're speaking of here, and, and we think they're too bad... Let's just take a second and look at us. I want to ask you this set of questions. Are you comfortable in your captivity or bondage, whatever it is? And everybody has different things. Are you comfortable there? Do you fit comfortably in society or the world around us? Is it easy for you to follow their ways and not think about God or how it affects him? Do you feel you're doing well? You're okay? Remember all the self-help stuff? I'm okay, you're okay, so you know, everything's fine. When, when God looks at it, it's not fine. 
Do you think you've grown spiritually about all you need to? Do you think you're in a, in a good spot and that's where you can stop? Those are all signs of complacency. And they all happen in Christians as well. We all think, you know, and, you know, I even, I even joke around when, when I mess up uh, or I say something wrong or, or have a bad attitude day or something, you know, and, and I say, well, you know, God's got a lot of work to do on me, but I'm way better than I used to be, right? And I am, it's true that God does have a lot of work yet to do on me, and I am way better than I used to be. But still, it's no excuse for me to become complacent with living and, and thinking and behaving like that. See, just as the Jews were not meant to put down roots in Persia, we are not to look at this world as our permanent home. Once we become believers and followers in Jesus Christ, once we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, we become adopted into God's family. And then our permanent residence becomes, is his permanent residence. It's in heaven. As we look forward to that. Scripture tells us this. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And also, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, the apostle writes, With our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Our permanent citizenship is in heaven. We're just kind of like them Jews. We're just passing through here once we accept Jesus Christ. And God doesn't want us to pick up the ways of the world, their thought patterns, or um, their behaviors, any more than he wanted them to be living and thinking like the Persians. Now, it's not wrong to pursue a career or a, a good job or to build a house or a home. But the Lord doesn't want us to lose our eternal focus. That's what the, his point is here. Not to lose our eternal focus. That this is what it's all about. And that's what he, he wanted with the Jews back then as he was bringing them back home. We need to remember who's in charge of this. God the Father's in charge, right? He has a good and perfect plan for all of this. Our hearts should break over our continued sins, just as God's does. Our hearts should break over the condition of the world we live in. Instead of raising ourselves up and thinking, you know, that's where the complacency comes in. I don't behave like them. You know, I've gotten better. But what about them? God's heart's breaking for them, just like it was when we were lost. Our heart should break for them. Our heart should break for the church. A lot of churches aren't doing what God's called them to do. And God's heart breaks over them. Jesus speaks to that in, in Revelation, that God's going to judge the church. We need to be found to be faithful to living by his word and following his will and his way. Our heart should break knowing the fact that God's heart is breaking. We should, we should just be grieving. God wants us to be different. He wants us to look. We need to live in this world, and we need to live right while we're in this world. But by the same token, we need to remember that we're not here forever. The one
day Jesus is going to come back and those of us who know him as Lord and Savior will go to be with him. And then there'll be no more of this sin problem. No more of this needing our hearts stirred up. And I'm sure all of us, including myself, at different things and different points and different aspects of my life I need to have my heart stirred as we all do. So, please, don't become complacent in your walk with Jesus Christ. Every day we should be moving closer to him. Let's look at verse 6. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. When the Israelites left slavery in Egypt, they plundered them. They just... God kind of gave them a blank mind in that, and they just gave them all their gold and silver, and they took it away with them. There was no good feeling really about it. But here it's kind of different. Uh, this time there's goodwill that caused the giving. The people around them were glad to assist the rebuilding of the Lord's house. So they gave things so they could have uh, food and supplies for their journey back to the promised land and to be able to rebuild God's uh, temple. Some of the fellow captives gave, the ones who were born in captivity, that didn't want to leave. To them, that was their home. And they chose to stay, but they knew the others needed to go, and that God called them, so they, they helped with that. Some of the Assyrians gave, and the Babylonians, the ones who either favored Cyrus, because he put the proclamation out, or they actually cared for the Jews but they gave so that the others could go. Verse seven, Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Now, <clears throat> Cyrus gave back. Remember uh, when we, we talked back in, in Second Chronicles, when Nebuchadnezzar took down Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple and he took all of the, the articles of the worship service and that, all the gold and silver. They even broke down the big pillars and that that were gold into small enough pieces to carry it away. He took all of that and put it in his treasury, some of it. Some of it he put in the, the temples of the, the other gods, the little G gods that, that they worship. And he put it in there. Um, so, and there was a reason that he did that. Removing religious items from a defeated foe's sanctuary showed domination. By showing that the group's deity, or God, whoever was protecting them, was no longer able to protect them. If I can come into your temple and take your stuff, your God's not doing the job. So when they are returned back to that people, they can continue the ritual life of their community and it provided a means for them to continue worship. See, remember when the, when the Jews got took into captivity and got took to Persia? They took all that stuff. They, they destroyed the temple. They had no place to worship. By giving it back, now they have their stuff. And we'll see in the, the, the next one that they begin to build the temple. And the first thing they do is build an altar so they actually can worship and sacrifice the way God called them to do that. Now, one of the other reasons is <clears throat> that God protected all this stuff. When, when Nebuchadnezzar took it and he put it in these, these false uh, temples with the false gods in that, and in his treasury, it was protected. And that was part of God's plan. And the prophecy is in Jeremiah 27 and verse 22. If we back up to verse 21... Uh, Jeremiah 27, 21 through 22 says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and in Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon and remain there until the day when I visit them, declares the Lord, and then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. God had them in stories there. So once again, we see how God good and perfect plan used a pagan evil king to take care of his stuff while he disciplined his people. 
And it could have been, had God not guided that, melted down and made into some false idol thing to, to worship, like that golden calf they made, remember, at the, at the bottom of the mountain? But God didn't allow that to happen. He had protected it. And it was prophesied by Jeremiah that that would happen. So once again, we see God using pagans or unbelievers to accomplish his objective. Verse 8. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in charge of Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Seshbazar, the prince of Judah. Mithridath was the treasurer and gave an accounting of all these different items to Seshbazar, the prince of Judah. Seshbazar, Seshbazar, boy, I wish these guys had easier names, <laughs> was a political appointee of Cyrus to oversee Judah, okay? He served as like the deputy governor. He was a political appointee, but he was not God's man. God's man was Zerubbabel, who was the leader that was recognized by the Jews and by the, the Lord. But uh, Mithridath, he was the one that uh, Cyrus put in, in charge of that. Zerubbabel, even though he led the first uh, home going there, did not serve as a king, but he was in the, uh, the Davidic line of the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 12, you can see his name in there, that he's part of Jesus Christ's lineage, Zerubbabel is. Verse 9 and 10. And this was the number of them, of the, the vessels, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. The number of them, it added up to 2,499, okay? These are representative of the total amount. In verse 11, we're given a, a number of 5,400. This was just, because they didn't count all the bronze stuff in that in the, in the previous chapters, but with a full accounting, according to God's word, is 5,400, okay? Verse 11, all the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All of these Sej Bazaar brought up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. The exiles, we know were the Israelites taken into captivity. We know that Cyrus had appointed a governor to watch over him. But God had appointed Zerubbabel as the man to oversee the return to Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> next week we kind of look at the, the number of the people that went. But it was no small feat for them to return back to Jerusalem. That journey took anywhere, depending on, on what study you look at it at, anywhere from three to five months to travel. And there were many, many people. Um, and we'll, like I said, we'll take a look at that again. So God has, has taken them. He has disciplined them. But he did not abandon them. He is now working to return them to home and restore them to what they were. So we need to remember that. So God is really good through this, even though it sounds terrible what started. But now we begin to see the city, the, the temple first will be rebuilt, and then the city, and then things will get back to the way they were prior to that. So as we get ready to close today, my question for you is this. What might the Lord be stirring up your heart to do? And really, you're the only one that can answer this as you talk to God. What might the Lord be stirring your heart to do? And then the second part of that question is this. What things of this world might be keeping you from sharing his priorities. What's standing between you and the Lord? And that happens because it happens personally to me. And part of my prayer and meditation time with the Lord is I ask him to show me. I can't always see it. 
show me what's standing between you and me. What's keeping me from being the man you've called me to be? What's keeping me from being like your son, Jesus Christ? And he will show us that stuff. And I can also tell you from personal experience, sometimes it's a pretty ugly picture he'll show you. But he'll help you through it, just as he's doing with the Israelites. Because we know this from their experience. If you don't listen, he will discipline you. But we also know from their experience that he will never abandon you. Scripture tells us he will never abandon, he will never forsake us, he'll never leave us, he'll always be there for us. And the same Lord that's doing this is there for us. And we just have to ask for his help. If we could have done this on our own, there'd have been no need for Jesus to leave glory and come to die on the cross of Calvary. But there's absolutely no way that we can do this without his help. We need to help each other. And as I said earlier, we definitely need to pray for each other. Lift each other to the throne. Pray for that umbrella of protection and security. For some reason, you know, like I said earlier, Satan seems to want to get in here all of a sudden, and he's really mixing things up around here. <coughs> people's health, people's families, taking vital members of the ministry away from us. You know, um, that's Satan's thing. So we need to ask God to help bind him up. That's what he does. He's already won the victory. And the victory is ours through Jesus Christ. We can claim that. We have to do that. Because Satan cannot read our minds. So we have to tell him, you have no authority over me. Lord bought child of the king. And you got no authority over me. I belong to God the Father. Jesus Christ the Son. And it's in his blood. Authority in his blood that I pray this. And he's got to submit to that. He has to submit to that. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Father, for your written word. We thank you of the example we have of your chosen people. In serving as your chosen people today in the New Testament church, we pray, Father, that we be found obedient. Father, that we'd be willing to listen when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Lord, we ask that you continue to guide and direct us. We pray for your protection. We ask that you would restore those who are outside this community today with sickness or uh, they're just out in disobedience following the world. Father, I pray that you'd restore them all and bring them back to us. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything you've done for us. And we just ask that we'd be, again, Father, that we'd be found obedient to your word, to your will, and your ways. Father, that we'd not become complacent when we start to say that the world's okay, I'll just let them be. They're just doing their thing. But the Holy Spirit would get a hold of us quickly. And we'd recognize the sin for what it is. Father, we thank you and praise you. We love you and adore you. And we surrender to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.